Good evening, everybody. I'd like to welcome you to Hartman Baldwin's Construction Showcase this evening. I hope you all have had a good productive day, had a chance to grab your favorite evening beverage and a comfortable seat and spend the next 45 minutes, hour with us, looking at this, at this beautiful home that you see in front of us, a home that we're very proud to showcase tonight and, and share with you uh, the, the beautiful things that we did with our clients in this particular home. Uh, as you see, this is a Spanish colonial revival home built in 1929. And the uh, current owners purchased this house and right away uh, brought us in to have a look at it before they even moved in and uh, explained to us about what they really loved about the house and about their desire to renovate it and remodel it and really kind of bring it up to uh, current day standards. You know, they wanted to pay homage to the, to the beautiful character defining features that you're gonna see in the home, but yet also bring it up to a point where they were comfortable living in it. And which was a good thing. This particular house uh, is on the Mills Act and it was on the Mills Act when this uh, owner bought it. To give you just a brief idea of what the Mills Act is, is it's a designation on a historic home that allows, that stays with the home, that allows for tax breaks. And what you need to show is if you take the money that you're saving on your tax break and putting it into the home to uh, renovate it and keep it up um, and restore it, then you then that's a great way to uh, to make a little or have a little bit of money to renovate your home. So that was something that we needed to pay attention here because what that requires is us to, to um, keep intact those character defining features of a historic home. I do wanna take, uh, before we go too much further, I'd like to have you look at this uh, step inside the house for a little bit. Um, as we go through this, uh, if you have questions, some of you may, uh, there's a Q and A box in your Zoom screen. If you have a question, go ahead and drop it in there. We've got some people in the background that if it's a specific question, they'll be happy to answer it. If it's a more general question, we're gonna leave some time at the end uh, because that may be something that everybody's interested in. Um, so please, if you have any questions, go ahead and drop them in there and we'll make sure that we take uh, uh, time to answer all of those. Okay, before we go too much further, I wanna uh, introduce our design build team. Um, I'm pleased to have us tonight uh, joining us, the, our founder and CEO and the design build consultant on this project, Bill Baldwin. Hi, Bill. Hi, everybody. And, uh, I want to thank everybody for joining us today. Thanks, Bill. And our interior designer, Miranda Snap. Hi, everyone. Hi, Miranda. Thank you. And our construction manager and the project manager on this project, Troy Coates. How are you doing, everybody? Thanks for joining us. Hi, Troy. And our project architect, uh, Alan Brookman. Good evening and thanks for joining us. We had a terrific team uh, on this project. The clients were terrific. It was a terrific house and uh, we're thrilled uh, that you're uh, gonna get to see it tonight. Thank you, Alan. And I'll mention briefly, you'll hear a little bit more about the idea of design build, but you know, the, the thing that I love about this is here you have everybody that's concerned about the project, circling you, looking at the project from every single angle all under one roof, all with the same goal, making sure that, that you get what you want and you have a, as good a time as we can getting you there. And then myself, I'm Bill Judson. I'll be your host and moderator tonight, uh, guiding us through this, uh, this fun, fun time we're gonna have together. All right, I wanna take just a minute, uh, maybe Bill, if you could just share a little bit, give, give people an understanding of who Hartman Baldwin is and, and uh, a little bit of our background. Of course, although when we do this, I have to date myself, which is always unfortunate. Um, <laughs> we founded the company over 35 years ago. And uh, since our inception, we've all, always brought together the, this architecture, construction, and interior design. Uh, there's 35 of us now, and we have uh, offices in Pasadena and Claremont. We serve you know, much of the Southland in Southern California, and we specialize in... Uh, high-end residential remodel, uh, custom homes from the ground up, and restoration. Thank you, Bill. All right, so let's take a little bit of a sneak peek here at the project. We're going to give, give you a little bit of before and afters. Then I want to back up and talk a little bit about how we get from what you see before to the after. And then we'll take some time to go through the house 
uh, sort of room by room and give you a little bit of an insight and, and see what, what we've done and, and the beauty that this house ended up. All right, so let's, let's click through. I think, Alan, this was originally a sun porch, correct? It was. It was, uh, it was uh, there were five arches. It was open to the weather. Um, they were eventually enclosed and, and rather poorly. Uh, there was actually gr ivy growing under some of the doors. And then you can see what, the, what we did afterwards, you, replacing all those doors that Alan talked about, making them weather tight, adding a fireplace. I get that question a lot. You know, can we do that? Well, there you have it. We added a fireplace and a sneaky little TV, that picture that you see in the upper left corner that rolls up and, and unveils a, a TV behind there. We'll, we'll come back to this too and, and share a little bit more with you. Do you want to give you another little bit of before and after? Isn't that beautiful? There we go. That's more like it, right? Miranda, how did you like to work with this? In the, this is the, the owner's dressing room, correct? It is, yeah. She, she needed a space a little bit more so um, to accommodate what she has. And we worked through this, making it comfortable for her. She loved the light in there and she wanted to utilize the whole space for getting ready. And behind all those doors and drawers are all the fun accessories for her handbags and shoes and accessories. Cool. All right, so let's spend a little bit of time just talking about how we do this. We call this our, our design build process because uh, it's important. And there you see there's, we really break it up into, into four main categories, okay? Uh, the pre-design, our conceptual design, design development, and the construction itself, all right? What, uh, what we do in the pre-design, that's really all about spending a little time together. You know, for us, it's, it's meeting you, seeing what you have in mind, whether that's building a new home or, or renovating a home like this or a major remodel, answering your questions about how we work, understanding what your needs are. And if that's feeling good, then we'll get into the conceptual design. And this is really, in a lot of ways, an important part of this process. And what we wanna do here is just spend a little time figuring out what you want to do and how much it's going to cost, all right? We've spent a lot of time really honing this part of the process because the whole reason we did this was we were hearing so many horror stories of people spending, frankly, lots of money and time and emotion to end up with a set of drawings and then find out, oh my gosh, this is way more than we want to spend and having to either kind of give up or reel it all the way back, you know? Or even, you know, maybe having an idea of what they want to do and hiring a contractor and getting to work only to find that that number that the contractor originally gave you, you spent twice that and spent twice the amount of time. And, and that's a nightmare for everyone, you know. And so what we were finding is that a lot of times what people want to do and what they want to spend are two different things. And so in the conceptual design phase, what we want to do is get you the information that you need to bring those two into balance, to bring what you want to do and how much you want to spend into balance, because that's really what we need to figure out first. Okay. And so for us, that means do a little bit of design. We have a construction estimator that can look at those. So when we come to, get to meet with you very early on in the, in the process, We'll show you some design ideas. Oh, and by the way, this is what it may cost to get you again in that position where you can decide how you want to move forward, what you want to move forward on, and know that this is going to be real, reliable information. Once we have that done, then we'll get into the design development. And that's what we're going to spend a little bit of time on tonight, the design development because this was really a big portion of this project where we were selecting a lot of materials and finishes and getting the look just right for the client. And you're gonna see all sorts of little fun doodads and, and unique things that we wanted to incorporate in this as we were going through design development. And the end of the design development, we end up with a great set of drawings that you know exactly what the project is, that we can go and get approvals that uh, we can build to and that you know really the greatest thing is before we start construction we can get to we call it a zero percent error factor bid now what that means is hey we figured out the big picture 
we've figured out the details, we are guaranteeing that this is the cost of your construction, okay? Because now when we get into construction, a lot of those unknowns, a lot of those anxieties are relieved because we know exactly what we're gonna do and exactly what it's gonna cost. And so the construction can just move along uh, you know, that much better. The other thing we'll, we'll talk about more too is this whole team stays intact all the way through this process, okay? So let's talk a little bit more about design development. What do we do in, that, in the design development? So in the design development, as I talked about conceptual design, we've got the big picture, we know what the project is. Now we're gonna dive in deeper. We're gonna start developing the design, right? Figuring out all of the details. We're gonna start on the interior design. Uh, how, how is that going to all come together? Material selections. What is, you know, on the floor? What's on the, what's the tile on the wall? How does that work with the countertops, the light fixtures? That's where Miranda gets really involved, helping pull all of that together. So we end up with that great set of working drawings that I mentioned before. So let's, let's take a look at the result of some of that design development. You're going to see in the next slide, a sheet showing you a lot of detail, okay? So this is, as we get to the end of the design development, this is what we're gonna find. What are we doing? We're going through, we're looking, you know, here we've got, what does the north wall of the kitchen look like, right? Every single wall of that kitchen, east, south, west, we wanna, we wanna draw all of that so you can see how are my cabinets gonna line up? How does that hood relate to that window? Where are my plugs? What's the tile pattern? All of those things. We'll look again, you know, what does the island look at? We'll look at it from every single angle. Just give you all of that detail, not just so you can understand what it is, but then this also is a great set of drawings that when we get into construction, hey, there's no question. The tile guy knows exactly what that pattern is. The, the electrician knows exactly where all those plugs are, how high the lights are all that good stuff. Let's look at the next one. That shows you even more detail because in this, we're gonna see this bathroom. You can see this bathroom that we have up here and all of this beautiful tile work, right? Where now we've got a tile wainscot and we wanna pay attention to how the liner is. And we've got this sort of waste going around the room where that accent tile needs to line up all the way across the room. So we wanna make sure that that's all coming together the way that you like it. How high are the sinks? How high are the cabinets? What am I, you know? These are all things that, hey, we don't need this really to go and get city approvals or, or to build, but we wanna make sure that we're all on the same page while we're doing this, that you understand exactly what this is gonna look like. And sometimes even with these drawings and all of the material selections, it can be difficult for people to picture all of this so we'll start to do some, some computer renderings. And that's what you'll see in this next slide. Alan, maybe you could kind of highlight these for us and, or Miranda too, I know both of you worked on these. Renderings, so sometimes it's difficult for clients to have an understanding of really how that space is going to feel. And that's where the 3D renderings come into play. Um, especially for rooms that we might be looking at doing furnishings, for example, this master bedroom, there wasn't a whole lot of new that we did to this. We added a fireplace and we moved the windows out, but it was really the custom. We did a custom headboard. We did all the furniture and the accessories and drapery. So that allowed the clients to have a really good understanding of where we were going and how that was going to feel. And so there's the after. And what we did is we even went a step further and easeled these in the, the actual spaces so we were standing in the rooms and we did the presentation. That way the client really had a sense of what the when it was all said and done. Cool. I think the next one shows us maybe the kitchen. And the same thing with the kitchen. You know, we worked through all of these details and the process doesn't start, it doesn't stop at this and at start of construction. We're gonna still continue that evolution of really honing things in. So for example, with the kitchen, we had already selected the, we knew the flooring, we knew the countertops, the backsplash, the custom hood, and you'll see very subtle differences to the final, or very subtle, in that the shelving, we 
as we saw the rendering, we felt like, you know what, it was a little too much. So we ended up taking it down to two shelves over to the left. And the island changed ever so slightly. We actually did a further, you see there's that kind of smaller cutout in this rendering. And then if you go to the final, we did an ever so slight, took that back because of our spacing. So um, it just, it's so, it's a very useful tool in that they get a really good sense of what it's going to look like, have more dimension to it, more texture, and just helps the process. Yeah, and I think, yep. go ahead, Bill. Well, I was just gonna say, I think that, you know, even for us in the industry that have been visualizing these things for so many, you know, so long, it's really helpful to have this be part of the process too. So the whole team benefits from this. The, the clients get to see it and we get to see it really fleshed out and can work on the details better too. So it's good for all of us. Yeah, well, and and, uh, and of course, having us through the entire process through construction as well allows us to make little changes to improve the project um, even after we're you know technically finished with design. This room, on one last thing, this room and the, the sitting room upstairs. Everybody you see on this team tonight, we were there with the clients. Some of the biggest epiphanies in the projects, both about this room and other rooms, came from meetings we were all together in in, in these rooms, the most complicated ones. Yeah, and I think the next slide's a good example of what you guys are talking about, where I know I, I wasn't as involved as you guys, but you know, here we have the pool house. And you know, oftentimes we'll talk to clients about, hey, we have this idea of we'll put beams in the ceiling. You know, we'll add some beams, give it a nice detail. Well, what does that mean? How many beams? What's the size of those beams? Maybe you guys can fill in some, some of the things that were used to, we use this rendering for. So with this, we, just like Bill stated, we had full ideas of the TNG in between the beams. We had smaller beams, kind of more, more in the space. And as we saw the rendering, and as we were in construction, we were standing in the space looking at it, thinking, you know, that's getting a little too busy on us. Um, we're, we have a lot going on with our back bar, and we didn't really want that to be too distracting on the ceiling. So when we pan to the finished, you'll see that we actually spread them out a little wider. We, um, they're more reclaimed. We even did mock-ups in, in construction. So we built up mock-ups, we held them up, we did different spacing. That way, all of us as a team collectively with clients could really visualize it. So took it a step further, utilizing the 3D rendering and then actually doing mock-ups and being able to see it every way we could. And it really helps. Yeah, it does. I think that's a good illustration. I remember when I first came to work for Hartman Baldwin 15 years ago, one of the architects said, hey, you're gonna like it here because this is the only place I've seen where things can get better during construction. You know, and I know Troy and Miranda and Bill and Alan all worked, you know, and that's just one example of sitting there with the client, everybody together, sitting and putting these things up and deciding, hey, what's the best? What's, you know, what do we all like? And, and what's the best way to construct this as well? You know, and you can, when, when we're doing that and everybody's in that space and we're looking at these details, it's incredible. It's like a guitar comes into tune. We've done that with clients where you're holding something up, there's a certain detail and everybody kind of collectively goes, there it is. And that's, that's one of the really fun epiphanies of these things, you know? Yeah, and so, so these renderings are, are useful tools. And, and as you guys are hearing it, it doesn't just stop at the, at the design development. We'll get into construction and let me just talk a little bit about that because you're hearing, as Bill mentioned, this, these meetings with the client, sitting and looking at all these things. And that's really a lot of what it is, uh, what construction is about in, from a client's point of view, is that communication. Maybe, t uh, Troy, why don't you walk us through some of the key meetings and some of the things that, that you found in the construction of this project? Yeah, so pre-construction, as it says on the screen, what that means to us is that gives us a time before the construction process starts to come in and sit down with you and to ultimately ask you how you wish for your home to be you know, managed. How do, you, how do we work beside you guys and with you guys? Um, so what we've done is we've created an agenda over the years where we go through it. Uh, it's multiple pages long, but it's very detailed uh, process, uh, this pre-construction. We talk about everything from kids' names, pets' names, gardeners, pool people, whomever might be in, on, and around your site, we want to make sure that we know so that we can, we can continue to govern that and be the gatekeepers uh, while we're in fact there. 
You notice one of the things on the screens also says key meetings. So during our construction process, what we do is at this point when the construction starts, you gain yet another team member here. Uh, and that is the project manager that comes along. So after all the design and, and everything that Miranda and Alan and Bill have been doing, you gain an additional team member at this point. So we have, uh, when, when the construction process is going on, what we like to do is establish with our clients a weekly meeting. And that weekly meeting is attended by obviously our clients, a project manager and a project architect at the minimum. Uh, sometimes you'll see that Miranda will come into them, Bill will come into them, other people will come into them depending on who your team members will be. But that gives us a time to sit down, talk about your project in, uh, specifically and discuss things that are coming up, have happened. We go over a Gantt chart that has a full complete detail of everything on your project from beginning to end. And some of the key meetings that we have, even though we have these weekly meetings and you hear us talking about detail and how things change, I think Alan mentioned it and how we can go through the home and, and continually design and build as it goes. One of several of our meetings that we have on this uh, are electrical meetings, plumbing meetings and cabinet meetings. These are a little special of a meeting, uh, just slightly different than the rest of the meetings because what we do is we take the time to go through the plans that the architect has uh, developed for you and we go over each light switch, each outlet. We go over it in great detail, how far it is from the corner, how it looks, should we turn it vertical, horizontal, et cetera. And we do this with the cabinet meeting and plumbing meeting as well. Each cabinet door, drawers, if you wanna add a door, take away a door, put drawers in. But it's tailored to you specific. So that's, that's one thing that's really nice about those particular meetings. It's yeah, also- I always think those are great. I was gonna say, it's also the soft stuff. I mean, we're not only, building you something that's beautiful and, 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 and you know, well-constructed. We're having a relationship with you while we're building it. So, you know, at these weekly meetings, we're asking you, how about cleanup? How, how's the care and feeding of the house? Do you, do you still love us? I mean, we're, we're asking you all the details to make sure the relationship's good along with the process of building your place. Yeah, good stuff. All right, well, that's a little bit of the process. I wanna take a little time and take advantage of our, of our design build team here today and, and walk you through the house give you some before and afters and hear some of the fun stories uh, that, that developed as we worked through with these great clients. Here it is, the outside of the home, which got a, a completely uh, refresh, but really I'd like to take you inside and let's walk through. And now we're gonna, we're gonna see that entry again, this time the before, <laughs> quite, quite a difference here. One of the things I'll point out and, and Bill, maybe you could, you could uh, fill us in a little bit, but if you have a, a 1920s home, you may have this material that you see here in the entry of uh, called magnesite. This is a, a very popular material in the 1920s, and this particular home had that, and it holds up okay over time, but how do we handle things like that when, when we're in a home like this? And yeah, this is an interesting story. It, it was common from the 20s to the 40s, and this was listed as part of the mill tax, so it was something we were very interested in restoring but its condition was poor. We had to tie into it. And I've been in this a long time and I did four years ago, but the guy who was the expert then long since retired and our entire team combed the universe trying to find an expert. And we just turned over every stone in the universe, finally found an Instagram photo of some project up North, con contacted that builder, got a hold of this faux painter and we brought him out and we showed him all, you know, we were all excited. We want to do this, 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 and this. And the guy just calmly looked at us and said, yeah, that'll be no, we basically got a group hug at that point, and it just turned out fabulously. So it's a really interesting material, but it's very hard to find people who know how to work on it. Yeah, and I like the addition of that little door. That wasn't there before, right? Or is that, did they get some storage in there? That, we, we, we got storage, and then we called it our Hobbit door, as it's a little short, but it gives us great storage <laughs> staircase. Yeah, I think it's actually kind of a nice addition to the appearance of that entry, too. It is. Definitely. All right, let's let's step a little further in, take a look at the living room. And this room, this was the most restored room of the house. We didn't do a whole lot to it. Uh, we just basically freshened everything up, floors, took care of the mahogany. Uh, the, the tile around the fireplace was decayed and in bad shape. And so we took a lot of time to match the details and shape of everything in new stone. Uh, one of the interesting things on this part of the project was the client was very interested in bringing in a hi-fi stereo system, a turntable. And we want to be very discreet about it. And Ephany, looking at the two doors you see to the left of the fireplace, which were for wood storage. If you think it's the next slide, we'll show. Uh, 
where yeah where, where we ended up hiding that so we can click to that so that was a fun little detail to pull out turntable with all the albums below so it was, it was really nice yeah this is why i like getting involved in projects like this i mean that was that was actually tough to figure out and fit in there and, and album storage underneath and of course the turntable's got to be on a stable foundation or the records skip all over the place so those are a special locking drawer glides um, for when they pull it out, it locks into place. And all the stereo equipment's actually in the basement, so that's all run remotely down to the, the speakers and what on the amps down there. So lots of fun. You know, something else I remember on this, on this particular room too, guys, you know, we keep mentioning the Mills Act on this, and something that was on the Mills Act that had to stay and we had to preserve it was the mahogany downstairs, so the mahogany base case and the windows that are in this particular room. Uh, you know, you can imagine a 1929 home and, and what those windows were acting like and how they opened and or in this case, for the most part, didn't. Uh, you know, that was something that we went through and renovated and cleaned those all up and, and got them working again. So fun we stuff. We also had a very, very specific skip trowel finish in these existing rooms. And when we tied in, had to do new rooms, we were into a lot of expertise, but it's just seamless. You cannot tell where the old finish starts and uh, stops and our new finish starts. Very nice. And then I've, I don't know what we, what do we call this room? This is the before of the den or? The den. The den. den. Yeah. yeah, the den. This is, uh, this is the room that's immediately adjacent uh, to the room we just came out of. And you can see in the before picture, same thing, that the glass that was in there was art glass, uh, leaded glass. Uh, all very monotone, kind of uh, nothing really stood out. So what we did is we took advantage of taking the windows that we preserved throughout the rest of the house and had new windows made out of mahogany to then inset them in there. And on this particular uh, countertop, we used a zinc. Uh, so it was kind of fun, kind of uh, different texture and feel to it. This is also one of those areas that you mentioned earlier, Bill, in regards to the uh, kind of the hidden TV, if you will. On the wall, you can see a TV that's on. It almost looks like a picture actually here, but it's a, uh, when the TV is off, that's actually a mirror and you can't see the TV at all. So it's, uh, it, it's, it's also another little fun thing. And as Alan mentioned earlier, all the audio video for all of these uh, uh, TVs throughout, stereos, et cetera, are all throughout into the basement. So it all is fed from there so that we can have just this really clean kind of look of just a TV on the wall. That's one of the edicts, our, as you can see, it's a common theme with the, with the stereo equipment, the TVs. Our clients love technology, but they don't want to see it. It's all got to be hidden. <laughs> now, they don't like you know, refrigerators this, either. Um, no. and, this, this, this is true. And this is also actually one of those interesting rooms where uh, same thing in the front room in the entry is the magnesite. So these floors are magnesite. And what's interesting about the person that we found to to actually fulfill what we needed for the magnesite, actually refabricated some of the magnesite. So there was things that changed on the wall underneath the TV. There was a cabinet that was there and that the part of the floor and that base was completely missing. We had to have him come in and reconstruct it, tile the color in, et cetera, and, and match that. And, and just now it looks, it's, it's phenomenal. He, he was everybody's hero. <laughs> <laughs> Very key person. And Alan, you mentioned some about fridges. There's a there's a beverage fridge hidden in there somewhere, isn't there? There's actually two on either end of uh, of the uh, the cabinet. There are a couple of drawer refrigerators that are hidden behind the panels. Nice. Never know when you're going to need a cold drink, right? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's go back to that sunroom. I know we were going to jump into this a little bit, but this I think is one of the more drastic and and more beautiful improvements I think here. And we're going to see this, and maybe one of you could mention a little bit of those, those doors that, that were leaking and everything. Now they lead out to what looks like a nice patio. Yeah, and one of the, one of the nice features about, about this room now is that um, the tile in the room is actually a concrete tile, and it's the same material we use, but in a larger format out, out on the, the pool deck. So once you throw open those, those custom mahogany doors, that same material just flows outside. And it, it, it's more like the, the room it originally was, sort of indoor and outdoor. And, and we, of course, we lost one of the openings when we put the fireplace uh, in. Uh, the other thing we discovered when we were working on this is that um, you know, with all the changes that had been made to the room, the, the, the structure was in very poor shape. There was a lot of termite damage and rot. Um, which had actually affected the floor level upstairs. So that 
um, doing this work gave us the opportunity to structurally reinforce the house and, and make it, you know, uh, watertight. Um, and, uh, you know, it's a, it's a wonderful space. I think this may be the most transformed room yeah, on the project. Yeah, it's really, it's a huge difference. Even the, uh, even the entrance into the room, you know, it's not necessarily trick photography. Uh, the, the door that came into this room before this was actually just a singular door. What we did is we opened it up and, and put two beautiful mahogany uh, pocket doors in so that the doors disappear, they go into the wall, but they can in fact be closed off and make this kind of more of an intimate space or a closed off space, which you don't see it from this picture, but uh, it, it was something that we added to it that was fun also. Very nice. I remember that fireplace and the, the columns of it and, and the, the, the hearth and it's tie into the pattern on the floor we had there were none of those guitar strings comes into tune discussions about how all that stuff matched in to be just so. Yeah, that's a good point. And I think Bill, when we get, we'll go to this next slide and show you the bathroom. Talk about things tying in. <laughs> Absolutely, look at that. Well, this room was a, a challenge because it's very narrow, and uh, the, the, there's a bed. Uh, there's actually uh, what became the laundry room on the other side of the wall. So we couldn't really change any anything the dimensions of the room. Um, so just to your left is the toilet. The, the tub is under the main arch there, and beyond that is uh, is a new shower that had been part of the closet for the room that backed up. Um, that niche is still there for storage, but we've we've fit a closet in. But all the stuff on the right is custom designed. We used a wall mount faucet and a, a custom um, console sink to keep it, you know, very shallow. And then these cabinets are very shallow as well to uh, to allow enough room. And then, you know, basically we've imitated with with modern tile uh, tile work like you'd see when the house was built in the late 20s, 1930s. Um, wonderful. Yeah, it Wonderful little space. It is very beautiful. And I know Miranda, this is a, such a beautiful color palette. And I, I get that asked that question a lot. Like, I just don't know where to even start. I don't, you know, some people don't even know what they want. How, how do you take that on? Basically, I just start asking questions of color palette. What are colors that they gravitate towards? What are colors they don't care for? Um, patterns, motifs, you know, some clients, they don't love paisleys. Some don't like floral. So I try to get all of that information early on and that'll translate further down the road where when I start shopping for those items, I want to make sure that I'm honing in on what makes them feel comfortable and at the end of the day, be, love their space. Um, with this tile work, you know, like Alan said, it's brand new tile, but it's handmade and we wanted that effect of that it's aged. So you'll notice that on the walls, that modeling, you get that handmade modeling glaze. So it's nothing is perfect. The color is not perfectly uniform. And these clients, love they wanted that look. And one thing I'd like to talk a little further of when we get into construction is it's one thing to just select that, but we, we really rely on our installers to put it up in a way that it looks natural. So Random is one of the most difficult things to achieve. And what we actually did is in the guest bedroom, we taped out every single wall of this bathroom. And I hand laid out the tile with our tile guys. We made sure we mixed it properly. And then we, hand, we stacked every row and then they went and laid it up. And we did that and then we put tape where we thought, okay, no, that's too dark, that's too light to get that correct effect. So a lot, a lot of time and energy goes into making it look random and aged and modeled wow. in the crack. And if, yeah, I can, beautiful if I can, result. if I can brag on Miranda for a second too, in putting those palettes together, Bill, like you brought up, that's the thing is clients come to us with inspiration photos or concepts or something they've seen. And what we have to do is take the myriad possibilities in the universe and start to narrow it down. So our clients have ability to choose between a normal amount of decisions. And Miranda does that just exceedingly well. Thanks, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's take a look down. I think this is the dining room, right? Yeah, and we didn't, so not a whole lot was done to the dining room, uh, most of which is the original hardwood floors. We moved the opening into the kitchen, which is to the left of the screen. So there's some tie-ins, and we ran all new hardwood into the kitchen. So 
lacing that in is so, our guys did a phenomenal job of lacing that in where it's seamless. Um, windows all stayed, obviously some of which needed some work to be done to them. But with, with this space, we, you, we utilized the original chandelier. Um, and with the before, so the clients wanted to hold on to the true look of the hardware of all the windows downstairs, it's the original ironwork. Um, but the issue with that was the original ironwork stopped just on each side of the casings of all the windows, um, which didn't allow much light to get in. You can see kind of those are kind of pushed to the, cramped to the side to just get that natural light in. So we went back with all brand new custom iron hardware, similar style, but we did it in a way that we got more height in the room and we expanded it a little further so that with their new drapery, they could get as much view uh, and natural light into the space. Yeah, very beautiful. And I know this was, uh, we had an opportunity here to work with these clients, not just on the things that, that Miranda is talking about, but also on the furniture as well. Correct, Miranda? Yeah, so all the furnishing. So this house, every room we touched, uh, furnishings, drapery, accessories, all the hard materials, really everything. So this was a fun, this was a great project from start to finish, complete. Yeah, and I think it really shows with the continuity of everything and the continuity of the color palette, just having that all uh, thought out at the beginning and put together just really, really shows. Let's, let's take a step into the kitchen. Beautiful before shot. <laughs> I know that that potholder kind of looked like a Viking ship or something that was suspended. <laughs> it did. It did. It was. Let's go. Can you go back to the before for one quick second? You know, Miranda mentioned that uh, that doorway into the dining room, and that's what we see here. Okay, little just a subtlety. You can see we really didn't have much space for kitchen along this wall, and in fact, what looks like the 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 fridge kind of disappears into that wall. It's just a very narrow fridge. So by that simple move of moving that door, look at what we ended up with, right? We can get a full fridge right to the left of that door, a little bit more counter space. Um, and, and, and just with that little move makes such a, a more usable kitchen. Well, and move, moving the door also improved circulation from the dining room through the kitchen out to the backyard. And this is the primary circulation route through the house out to the backyard. So it, it gave us a great kitchen and improved uh, the, the circulation, the flow through the house. Um, and the owners, uh, the owners li do like to uh, you know, throw a party now and again. So uh, that was important for them. I, I think we did probably more studies of, you know, the, at least in the house, of the kitchen arrangement than any other room. Um, and it, again, it turned out uh, very nicely. Uh, I think the yeah. one piece that we kept in there is is the stove. Yeah, and that I popped off and opened my mouth about it. It was one piece. It was not in great shape. It was dirty, and I opened my mouth, and it's fine. Just somebody really needs to take the time. Guess who volunteered for that job? <laughs> so I ended up taking a Sunday, and going through every detail and cleaning it up. So if nothing else happens tonight, if people can appreciate the glean on that oven. I would really appreciate that. But we built a really beautiful matching hood for it too. So are you offering as CEO and founder of cleaning all of our clients' ovens? <laughs> do I do oven cleaning on the sides. Please appreciate the luster. Oven cleaning coupon, please. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing I think that's fun here is here we have a spot for some of our more important family members, right? Where I get that question a lot. What can we do with the dog bowls? I'm constantly putting these down, kicking them, having to put them away. But, you know, I, I encourage people to, to share stories like that because, hey, there's a solution for everything. This is also in keeping with the client's desire to have really cool things that are somewhat partially hidden. And there, there's storage racks on the columns that flank the oven, too, that pull out as well. So there's a lot of, lot of detail in this kitchen. In here. You also yeah. notice that the, uh, the window uh, above the sink was enlarged uh, and uh, to get a little more light in. And uh, Bill Judson just uh, just circled the uh, the columns to either side of the the stove, and those are actually uh, one to accentuate the stove. But uh, they also open up, and they're little uh, vertical uh, storage racks for uh, utensils for the stove that are hidden there. Very nice. I'm ready to get cooking dinner. <laughs> <laughs> just don't don't dirty up the oven, please. <laughs> 
Another before and after. I mean, I think this is a good, you look at the before and after, it's a, this is a good uh, example of retaining the style and the character of a 1920s home, but yet making it into a kitchen that we could all, you know, cook and, and up to contemporary standards, socialize as, as Alan mentioned, but still looks appropriate for the home. And if you notice that, I mean, the paint here is a glazed finish. You know, Miranda got together multiple, we had multiple mocks up of tones and how much antiquing. So we went through a lot of, you know, a lot of steps on that, just to get that dialed in just perfectly too. How about that hood? Yeah, that's a custom hood as well uh, that we had fabricated special offsite to tie in with that existing oven that Bill cleaned up so nicely, I might add. <laughs> <laughs> and, but uh, yeah, completely custom based off of Alan's drawings. And uh, we, we, sent, uh, we sent the drawings up north and had them make that. and and brought it down here and installed it. It's beautiful. Multiple tone too, two tones. Two tone, we went to a lot of time to pick out those tones too to kind of work with the oven and, and everything else as well. It turned out beautifully. I just saw a question pop up about the fabric under the sink. What was the story with that? Client wanted, so this client, she wanted softer elements. You can see that there's a lot of cabinetry. So every which way that we could introduce a little bit of fabric to soften it. She wanted that look. She just loved the, the look and showed us an image and we made it happen. And yeah. It's, it's uh, typical for uh, um, kitchen sinks of this period to be open underneath and they were frequently covered by, uh, um, you know, drapery like that. So it, it fits in with the period of the house too. Yeah. Cool. All right. What are we looking at here? That's that a little breakfast area into the new pantry. And we were very tight on space from the edge of that island and our main walkway from dining or the den to the backyard. So clients didn't want to do more built-in. You know, we didn't want to do more hard surfaces. They wanted to get something comfy and cozy. They, again, we got, this house gets great light and especially in this space. So we custom, I custom designed a settee for them and there you go. That uh, pantry in the background there was originally the laundry room. And so looking for a place to put those, they're up in a very narrow closet upstairs. And we actually had to, uh, to draw multiple plans of the, the washer and dryer moving into that space to make sure they could fit through the doorway. Um, also, the, uh, uh, the, the seating there, it, when you move it out of the way, it conceals the uh, the stairs down into the uh, the California uh, cellar. Ah, uh, secret hatch. Secret yep. hatch. Yeah. <laughs> it's very nicely in the floor. It's got hydraulic lifts, so it's very really light when it pulls up too. More more hidden jewels. <laughs> hidden jewels. All right, let's walk back to the entry and talk a little bit more about that. Here's a before shot. Yeah. It was Cascading light fixtures are really yeah. nice effect there. We, I, was, I was originally a proponent of, of staying with a single chandelier. We had many discussions about that. Miranda came up with the idea of the descending ones, and, and my single chandelier idea got voted off the island. <laughs> <laughs> Our issue is that entries was, it's pretty dark. It doesn't get a whole lot of sense. There's not really a direct window in there. Um, and that single light was just not throwing enough light upward into the upstairs hall and downstairs. So we needed to come up with some solution and this helped with that tremendously. You know, I remember a quick little story that we, you know, we weren't sure, even though we spaced them out, we weren't sure exactly what height they were. So we had our electrician come in and wire them up, but yet we would just, we stood leaning over the rail and we'd pull the lights up to certain, certain, certain heights just to gauge how the light cast down, whether it Kind of complemented the top but also gave task lighting for up at the top it was elegant enough to kind of pyramid down how it did that and uh yeah i can remember hanging over that rail many of many of hours <laughs> Those I, things think, are heavy. I think i gave up on my single light idea and was willing to help you all by then too <laughs> <laughs> okay let's go into some of these other rooms wow that's a difference yeah it is so this is their sitting room upstairs and it's kind of their overflow. They, before they go to bed, they wanted somewhere that they could sit, be comfortable. They have a lot of family that stays with them. They wanted most of their common spaces to be comfortable. 
and they wanted to utilize every square inch they could of, especially this room because it's so small, they want to get as much seating up there. There's a TV just directly across from it um, that's not shown. So with this, that's a custom sectional. Alan helped with getting, we have AutoCAD, he had all these ways of how it's gonna turn the corner and get through the doorway and get all those pieces in there. And as you can see, I mean, it's, we have like an inch on either side. So um, that's, that was the, the goal they wanted in here. Uh, we lost a window because of the fireplace down below, but you can see still wonderful light coming through there. Yeah, nice, really nice sanctuary. We, we used to have t-shirts in our company years ago that said Hartman Baldwin, more thoughts per square foot. But I think everybody's hearing on this project was more thoughts per square inch. There was, I mean, everything was done into the inch on this project. You know, something that you can't see in this uh, picture either is uh, this is one of the rooms that upstairs where we put the exterior blinds on. Uh, so we did a remote Sophie blind that will come down, shade the room in the, uh, in the afternoon to keep that harsh sun from coming in and, and, and warming up the room too much. So, and those are all set up on, on remote and digital timing, et cetera. Another hidden technology. Another hidden technology. <laughs> oh, and there's a fridge in this room too. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Never know when you're going to need a beverage. Never know. All right. Let's step into the, the master bedroom. We saw this a little bit earlier, but... Yeah, there was, this was a little bit of a challenge because the clients realized, well, they wanted to get a king bed in this room and the space in between the windows would only accommodate a queen. So the, the decision was actually made in construction to move those windows out to accommodate a larger bed. Um, we added the fireplace and we didn't do a whole lot to this room. Uh, obviously fresh paint, new light, but mostly the custom furnishings and drapery. Um, we do have, like Troy said, we have the motorized shades on the outside. There are also motorized shades in, a, in these two rooms on the inside as well. So they have the capability of using both. Um, and that's why we did a lot of, you'll see balances to hide that. So all the equipment is, uh, is tucked up underneath there. You know, one of the things on this too is, you know, Miranda, you mentioned how we move the windows out and something like that is, you know, it has to be taken seriously, right? We have to look at it from every angle. I, re I remember when we talked about this, we actually would go outside and look at it and how those windows related with where they were gonna move in conjunction with the windows in the rooms next to them, as well as the one around the corner. So something that, you, you know, you don't wanna just do it from one angle. You really wanna make sure that you're, you're, you're checking it from every direction. Yeah, and I think that's a good example of how a decision of, hey, we'd like a king bed in here and just the ripple effect that that can have. And we wanna make sure we're looking at that from every single angle. Definitely. Now let's take a step into the bathroom. <laughs> Another one, just such a stark difference. We had to uh, carefully design the backsplash on, on the, the custom vanity here uh, to fit under the existing windows and still provide you know, a working backsplash against the faucet. So the idea was to, uh, you know, do something elegant that kind of matched the curves on the front of the cabinet. And that was all custom done for this room. And yeah, we I like the way that the, that the curves get picked up in the, in the mirror as well. Very nice. The sink that was in this bathroom, the client loved. It's a copper sink, a uh, hammered copper sink. And we actually saved that for a different space we'll see in a little bit for the pool house. So that was kind of a neat uh, to hold on to and, and reuse. All right, speaking of pool houses, let's go outside. Here you can see this is that, uh, what, what Alan was talking about in that enclosed porch. And you can see that it had these full height arch top windows. Well, those got transformed because I believe the client wanted a, a deck out off of there, correct? Yeah, well that yeah. was the real trick with this space was, uh, you know, the, the main, you know, the main entertainment space was that sunroom and the den, and we needed to get out to the backyard. So we raised up the platform here um, and came right out, right out from the sunroom onto the, onto the platform. And that allowed us to, to put the, the spa in and let that spill into the pool at the same time. And then there's a little, uh, a little um, what do you call those things? The, the swim out here, um, uh, the, the beach the entry. The Baja shelf? No, Baja, Baja. shelf. There we go. <laughs> Thank you. Once again, the guitar coming into tune there, huh? That all just fits it's, so nicely it's, together. It's impressive how, this is not a giant backyard, but it's impressive how much bigger it became 
as this scaled so well from the pool to the deck up to the house and the pergola, it just completely changed the way that back, backyard space felt. And now for perhaps the coup d'etat, let's go into the pool house where that hopefully you all know by now is a before shot and the after. Maybe we should go inside. Yeah, let's, let's talk a little bit about these doors here that we see. We can see one door opening and then, and then the door panels to the right. What, what, walk me through what we're seeing there. Well, this is, uh, we've seen the inside of this before. That's, uh, that's that bar, um, but it also had to be a, a functioning garage for you know, city code purposes. So this was designed to be uh, converted back if, if we ever needed to park in there. So those, the, those door panels are actually on a track and they, they in individually slide and stack. So you can completely open up that, that space or just a single doorway, depending on, on your uh, needs at the time. Also, I should point out, you can't see all the equipment for, uh, you know, for conditioning this space and uh, running the, the, the bar and whatnot. They're up, uh, up tucked uh, on a little alcove behind the roof there. And that, of course, is visible right from the master bedroom. So we also studied that very carefully to make sure you couldn't see any of that equipment. I love those sort of dual purpose, too, of, of maintaining the ability to have a garage, but yet having this wall that completely could open up and you mentioned the entertaining aspect of it. So that indoor outdoor living uh, that we, we enjoy so much for most of the year here in California is really uh, played up here. We actually have gas lamps on the house too, which was a, a fascinating addition. We went through a lot of details and fire testing to make sure everything work. So they give an incredible effect at night. Well, the only gas lanterns you could get were like these really enormous things for like restaurant spaces. So we actually had, you know, smaller versions custom made. And then we had to you know, test them for the fire department to make sure they weren't going to burn the, the house down. <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> All right. Each, each one of those, each, and each one of those lights, I'm sorry, my, my computer shut off, so I, excuse me for uh, just stepping back in. I don't know if you mentioned on each one of those lights, you know, they were just a flip of a switch on the inside. Each one of them had their own igniter, own gas to them, and it was just, it was just as convenient as flipping a switch for them to come on. All right, let's step inside and, and see if we can, there you can see it before, a little bit of an improvement here. But just a great, there you see those doors. You can imagine that completely opening up uh, right onto that lawn that we saw in the previous picture. But really creating just a great pool house, I'll say it, party space, right? <laughs> and this is where I have to brag about Alan uh, for a minute, is that like Bill said earlier, this, this project and especially that whole back bar that we're viewing right now and island, we are using every square inch of that and behind almost every door and drawer that you see is somewhat of an appliance whether it's the ice makers under counter refrigerator uh we have a full refrigerator a soda machine a wine dispenser we have a frost rail on top so he has secret access panels in the front that can pop out we have a beer keg so that you can access that alan put more <laughs> things in here for our clients <laughs> love to entertain and they had a you know a, a long wish list and alan met every single one of those i mean it is highly impressive and great job alan <laughs> we did, did make sure that it was to be known to our clients and we did want to test this place out when it was done <laughs> <laughs> and this is the pool bath another huge difference yeah there's, there's the sink yep Oh, that's the copper sink that was originally in the master bathroom. Yeah, and that door that we're seeing on the right, that's into the sauna. And there's a shower in here that's just behind what we're looking at. And with the tile, you'll notice the tile on the walls and the deco tile on the floor, um, that's all custom. And through the process, the design development process, I will try to get an information of what colorways we're going to look at some different motifs, different patterns, and we will custom order those different tile samples in the, in what we're looking to do. And we ordered a handful of different options. And it's amazing how 
different, a pattern may look with just different colorways or a different way that it's used or inserted. So we all held those up as a team, stood back from them and, and hand selected and got that all, you know, dialed in uh, for, to finish the space off. The, the corbels on the on the console sink here um, also are custom designed and, and they pick up some of the um, elements that you see on the lanterns outside. Very nice. Well, thank you guys. I think I, uh, I'm ready to move in or at least I'm ready to go spend the <laughs> evening in the pool house. <laughs> <laughs> I want to uh, thank you all for joining us tonight and I want to thank Alan and Miranda and Bill and Troy for, for giving us such great tour and, and uh, insight into this home. Uh, I want to discuss just a couple things here real quick. Uh, hope you've enjoyed your time with us tonight. We've got some other opportunities to learn more about us, learn more about the process and see some other great projects. Uh, you'll see up there on your screen, September 10th, we're going to be broadcasting one in our series of Remodeler Survival Guide series, Avoiding Remodeling Pitfalls. Uh, that's a great way to get your head into just starting to think about remodeling and making sure that uh, you're setting yourself up for su success. On September 22nd, we'll be broadcasting another uh, uh, construction showcase. Uh, so be sure to keep an eye out for that. And then we always uh, offer anybody that's, you know, in our service area, if it would be helpful for one of us to come out, spend a little time with you, talk about what you have in mind with your house and, and who we are. Uh, we're certainly open to scheduling that. We're obviously in this time of COVID, we're able to do that virtually. Uh, or if you feel comfortable having us in your home, we can talk about that as well. And to keep up to date with all of these things, stay in touch with us. You know, you can find us on all of your favorite social media platforms, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube. We have a great YouTube channel. If you go on there, search Hartman Baldwin, you'll be able to see some past construction showcases. So if you're interested in seeing some other projects, some other home styles, uh, there's some great resources there. And then, of course, Howls and Twitter, you can find us there as well. Um, we're bumping up right against our time here, but I promised that we'd leave a little time for questions and answers. Uh, I did see we had some pop up. I don't know if we left our, our do we have any uh, open questions out there? There is one from Joanne. It was for me and it, she, she asked, uh, in a colonial Spanish style home, I noticed the kitchen cabinets and much of the furniture seems to be more French provincial rather than Mediterranean Spanish style. Was that a client preference or an intended design process or question mark? Thanks. So uh, to answer that question, Joanne, this was client driven. She was drawn to that a little dreamier, airy, lighter. She didn't want to go too heavy. And so a way that we tried to keep that where it translated a little bit to the architecture were some of the motifs and patterns we used in the tile work the fabric patterns, um, her colorway, she wanted to keep lighter and a little more neutral. So we also tried to tie that into even the exterior colors. Um, so as you move through the spaces, we tried to tie those in in that direction. But yeah, it, it was client driven uh, to answer your question. And I think that's okay. I mean, we don't have to stay completely true. We, we don't want it to be completely foreign from the exterior, but to be able to navigate, you know, some, some clients, they can't change the exterior of their home. They want the inside to feel a different way or not completely foreign. That's fine. We just try our best to work in the little details to have those things connect a little, a little more so. Yeah, I think you did a great job, Miranda, of marrying those two things with the architecture and the, and the interior furnishings and everything. Really, really looks great. Okay, I, I don't know that we have any other answer, unanswered questions. I just flipped through those. It looks like we got answers for all of those. So again, I'd like to thank you all for spending an hour with us this evening. I hope it was helpful. I uh, hope you learned a little bit, maybe got inspired. Uh, stay connected, stay in touch with us, and uh, we'll hope to see you all again uh, in, in our next Zoom presentation. So thank you, everybody. Have a good evening. Good night, everyone. Bye. Bye.